right, Scott, we can start whenever you'd like. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Scott Delman, Interim Chair of CORE Inc., uh, as well as CORUS's Treasurer, uh, CORUS doing business as CORUS. Our previous chair, Michael Forrester, retired from IEEE on March 27th, 2020. The board asked me to serve in a dual role as chair and treasurer until today's election. I wish to formally thank Michael for his service as chair of CORUS over the past few years. Before this annual meeting of members begins, I want to welcome you and express the board's thanks for your attendance today. Shortly, we will be telling you about Chorus's performance this past year and our plan for the year ahead. But as you will know, as you all know, our first order of business today is the election of directors. Chorus's board may consist of between 12 and 18 directors. Today, there are seven seats to be elected, and the number of directors is currently set at 18 including the executive director who serves on an ex officio basis, non-voting basis. The majority of directors must be affiliated with a member organization and represent nonprofit organizations. Additionally, chorus bylaws provide for the appointment of up to two members at large whose expertise the board determines would be beneficial to the corporation. Directors serve for three year terms and this slate will reach the end of their terms at the annual meeting in 2023. Now I'm gonna ask Robert Harrington, Chorus's secretary, to present proof of the due calling of this meeting. Robert? Um, yes, so hi. Um, I guess I just read this. So Mr. Chairman, I present the following, and you know, I'm sure it's there somewhere. Uh, the notice of the meeting dated March the 5th, 2020, March 16th, 2020, and April 7th, 2020, stating, the meeting's time, place, and purpose, and my affidavit stating that I caused a copy of the notice of this annual meeting of members to be sent to each of the voting members of record on March 5th, 2020, March 16th, 2020, and April 7th, 2020, all of which will be incorporated into the, the minute book of the corporation as part of the minutes of this meeting. Um, a complete list certified by me as secretary of the voting members of Chorus as of the close of business on April 2nd, 2020. The record date fixed in accordance with the bylaws of the corporation. The list will be kept open for the inspection during this meeting and shows that at the close of business on April 2nd, 2020, there were 48 voting members of Chorus. Thank you, Robert. To facilitate the, the conduct of the election, the secretary has appointed Tara Parker and David Crotty as the inspectors of elections. The inspectors have taken a poll of the members represented at the meeting and have confirmed that there are present at this meeting online or by proxy. Tara, how many? Uh, how many? 31. Great. Voting representatives of voting members of chorus who are voting members of record at the close of business on April 2nd, 2020. One third of the voting members, which equals 16, is the quorum to do business. The quorum of the chorus voting members being present in person or by proxy. This meeting is declared lawfully and properly convened. In terms of the process, uh, Howard, do we do the actual elections now or? Yep, I'll keep going. The secretary will now present the nominations for the board. So it's back over to me. Um, I nominate the following to serve as members of the board of directors of Chorus, each for a three year term ending at the annual meeting in 2023. And I guess I should note, Howard, that there are bios available. Um, and there have been, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can view on, in, a, in a separate document. Um, so the first one I have here is Dean Sanderson. Um, from Spring and Nature, and then Will Schweitzer from Silverchair. Um, and for second terms of three years, uh, somebody called Robert Harrington um, from the American Mathematical Society, uh, Sarah Girard, American Institute of Physics Publishing, and Gabriel Elsevier, Vincent Lizzie from Taylor and Francis, and Alex Vance, Alexandra Vance, I'm sorry, I should spell you out completely, um, from Geoscience World. Does someone second these nominations? I second these nominations. 
No independent nominations having been received, nominations are hereby declared closed. If there is any member present who has not voted previously by proxy or who wishes to change their proxy vote, please use the Google form listed on the agenda and cast your vote. The inspectors will collect the votes in five minutes, at which time the voting will be closed and the inspectors will make a final tabulation of votes at that time. Scott, we can also tell you that the, the link to the Google form is also in the Zoom chat. Thanks, Howard. While the votes are being tabulated, I, uh, Scott Delman, also serving as treasurer of Chorus, will give a brief report on the financial status of Chorus as of the end of our 2019 fiscal year. So what, I, what I'm looking at the notes of this, um, and, and of course, uh, uh, Howard sent these to me the other day, some of the notes are exactly the same as last year. Uh, and what's funny is, um, as I read the, the uh, narrative here, uh, it says that it's worth noting that these kinds of financial reports tend to be a little bit on the dull side. So I'll try to, to keep it brief and answer any questions you may have. Uh, certainly we did the same thing last year. Um, Big picture for Chorus, uh, still a, a relatively young organization. Um, you know, we're what, five, six years old. And, uh, and uh, certainly we are, as we, uh, as a board and as a group of, of officers uh, interacting with staff, um, we're always taking the long view towards, uh, towards Chorus and uh, the services that it provides. Um, when you look at the membership of the organization, uh, and you look at the percentage of content, uh, scholarly published content that those members represent, it's still very much um, and, and growing a critical mass uh, of membership. So while there are only 50, 50 some odd members in the organization, uh, what's clear is we represent a, I believe it's still a majority, well over 50% of all of the scholarly literature that's published uh, worldwide. Um, so, of course, Chorus continues to have a pretty strong impact just uh, based on the size and, and, and uh, uh, sort of scope of, of its publishing activities from the members. 2018-2019, um, Chorus diversified its revenue. Uh, we continue to bring on uh, more of the institutional dashboard services. Uh, we hired a third-party subscription agent in, uh, in Japan named Kina Kunya. Uh, to, to help us to penetrate that market uh, further, working with Mark Robertson. Uh, and of course, uh, the goal is uh, this year, obviously with all of the challenges that we have, uh, to continue growing that, uh, that institutional dashboard service in addition to the core services that we provide. Uh, next slide, Howard, thanks. Um, but still as a relatively new organization, we face many of the same challenges uh, that, that all organizations in our industry are, are facing these days, uh, fundraising, managing operating costs and cash flows, uh, introducing and tweaking business models, looking for new opportunities, uh, and, and ultimately positioning the organization for growth. Um, over the past year, uh, and a lot of this of course is pre-COVID-19 pre pandemic, uh, we've been focused on all of the things uh, that, that are mentioned above. Um, I'm gonna just update you as, as the membership, of course, on a few of these, uh, these elements. And then at the end of all of this, it's certainly free to, to uh, ask questions and, and I'll provide answers. Howard can provide answers as well. Um, it's, it's important to say that we are in relatively good as we sort of finished the, the fiscal financial year last year, uh, we're in pretty good uh, financial situation. Um, there's more cash in the bank uh, than we had in previous years. Um, and if you think about maybe last year's, for those of you who attended the meeting, um, one of the yardsticks that we've, we've used in, in recent years uh, was to, uh, to sort of gauge how we were moving towards sustainability, was to see when we were borrowing uh, next year's cash, uh, in, in this case, this year's cash uh, last year, and, and that, Time frame continues to kind of push towards the full year. So um, we obviously want to get to a, a situation where we're no longer borrowing from next year's cash at all uh, in order to pay this year's expenses. And, and once we get to that point, I think we can um, hopefully say that we are in a in a far more sustainable position. But certainly, uh, we can say that we're in a we are in a um, a strong position uh, and and uh, moving in the right direction. 
Um, Howard, make the next slide. So um, big picture, looking at, at revenues, um, 818,000 expenses um, managed very well by Howard. Uh, keeping those expenses always, of course, below the uh, the revenue line, which has kind of been the key, uh, the key to our our sustainability and, and financial stability, um, and and what you notice on that that bottom line, um, bluish green, is is the cash position um, uh, finishing uh, last year in in a pretty strong position at six hundred fifty eight thousand. Uh, a lot of that coming, of course, from uh, from twenty twenty. Uh, membership dues. Howard, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, this slide gives an overview of Chorus's financial history since the beginning. Uh, this was the year uh, revenue just edged out expenses. Uh, the green line represents our cash history, uh, which has improved, as I mentioned a minute ago. These numbers include the early loans of 2013 and 2014. Uh, the blue line represents revenue. Revenue is primarily from membership dues. Another area of revenue is institution and funder dashboard subscriptions. Um, obviously, this is a smaller portion of the revenue uh, than, than membership dues, and, and that will hopefully continue to grow in, in future years. Um, the red line represents expenses. Uh, this is most noteworthy as it highlights the challenges that uh, Chorus faced uh, in past years. Expenses were reduced by a substantial amount, and, and we've continued to keep them relatively flat. Um, that that six hundred and fifty-eight thousand at, at year end um, is is a favorable number for us, and uh, and I, I just want to commend Howard um, over the past year. Certainly, trying circumstances in twenty nineteen, um, going into twenty twenty, uh, but but managing to keep the core service that we offer uh, stable and and working with the vendors. Uh, to do that um, on on what we think is you know let's say a fairly lean budget uh, for for chorus um, let's look at a more detailed view of the expenses from 2019 in the next slide um, and and so you know if you look at kind of month month to month basis um, uh, back in in March of 18 going to March 19 um, you know around that 70 low low to mid 70s per month and then really uh, last summer uh, late spring into summer um, it became really clear we needed to uh, tighten our belts a little bit as an organization and so uh, Howard did a great job of, of lowering that, that expense line uh, through the end of the year. The 2019 revenue was slightly higher than budget um, it includes all 2019 renewals received as of December 31st, 2019, uh, 782,000 uh, new 2019 publisher and affiliate membership fees, um, plus paid services of about 34,000. Um, nothing was received from supporters. Chorus was not able to recruit new members in 2019. This is obviously, um, you know, one of the challenges that we have. We we have a relatively small number of of members, um, you know, just in absolute numbers. But of course, if you look at who those members are and, and the, the number of titles that they re represent, um, including the societies, obviously we're always concerned with the nonprofits as well, um, which is built into our mission and our bylaws. Um, and, and so many hundreds and hundreds of societies do their publishing activities via some of these large, uh, these large commercial publishers. So um, the, the total growth in membership um, I think is not fully indicative of the impact that we have, but but certainly just based on, on pure numbers, uh, it's been a challenge to get uh, new members to join Chorus. Um, and, and I think some of that historically is is one of the reasons why we've started looking to diversify the, the revenue stream with institutional dashboards. Um, most of the business development efforts were spent on new paid services uh, and certainly uh, this is going to be more and more of the focus in 2020, obviously challenging situation uh, under current circumstances. And we really don't know kind of if we project forward to the, the rest of 2020, we don't know what the impact of, of the pandemic will be on, on publishers, uh, how much those publishers are going to be tightening their belts uh, for the remainder of 2020. And then obviously going into Q3 
calendar year 2021 and what the impact will be. So we're, we're watching that obviously very closely uh, with Howard and, and uh, we'll adjust as we need to adjust um, on the expense line. And, uh, and certainly, you know, we take that into expectations when we do forecasts uh, for membership growth. Um, okay, 2019 actual expenses were 762 against a budget of 859. Uh, 2019 expenses budget was tough. It was tight throughout the year. Um, and, uh, and, and some of the ways obviously that we've limited that is travel expenses. Obviously nobody's traveling and Howard was doing a decent amount of traveling. Obviously that's, that kind of stopped uh, towards the end of the year going into this year. We expect that to even be lower obviously because of, of the pandemic. Um, and of course other, other costs that are built into that expense line or project management costs, marketing, consulting expenses, um, and, and all of that was managed well uh, through 2019. Um, and uh, so this is where we are um, in terms of, of, uh, of 2019 against 2019 budget. Um, positive variance, obviously. Uh, so, um, so this is all good news. Um, and I'm happy at the, at the end of this to answer any questions that you have about, about this. Uh, Howard, if you can jump to the next slide, uh, talk about budgeted expenses. Um, you'll see a few, few line items here. A um, couple of notable uh, items, Kina Cunha, as I mentioned, uh, the APAC agency fees, um, and, and we, we are seeing some growth, just starting to see some growth, I should say, uh, out of Japan um, and in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and then uh, maybe if you can go on to the next slide, Howard, I think that's really it. Um, so just to, to kind of summarize all of this and wrap it up. Um, I, I think Chorus is in a financially stable uh, position. Um, I would say in many ways, we're actually a bit more stable than we were last year, but we're still not where we ultimately want to be. And, and big picture, we, we want and need the organization to be growing, um, not just for the sake of growth, but, but because of the impact that it can have. Um, I, just as a personal note, um, as treasurer looking at the growth of the organization, um, and then looking at the world around us right now, um, you know, I, I think there's a general consensus that I'm seeing form in various uh, blog posts and workshops and conferences that, uh, that are taking place that uh, the, the pandemic has kind of, let's say, um, strengthened people's resolve that are, that are interested in, uh, and the sense of urgency in moving towards more of an open access world. Um, and so I think, you know, as it relates to Chorus and our ability to provide compliance related services and, and, and dashboard services data about uh, open access content in general, um, I think there's a world of opportunity for the organization. And, um, you know, the challenge obviously is in the near term, uh, budgets are going to be tight because of, of the university uh, situation and, and impacts on publishers. But, uh, but I think Chorus is very well positioned for growth. Um, and, and obviously that's what we'll be looking for in the future. Um, why don't I turn it over to the membership for a few minutes and if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer uh, those questions or, or pass those on to Howard or other, other members of the board. Tara, Howard, are there any yeah, I was gonna ask if there are any questions that are coming in. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, no, there are no questions in the chat. No questions at all to the financial picture. The, the financials, are you sure? I'm going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay. Um, the report of the inspection, so let me continue back to the election. Um, I'm hoping uh, Tara and Howard, can you confirm we have everything we need to proceed with uh, with the election process? We do, unless anyone who is on the call that has not yet voted. I didn't get anything in the... Give that a few seconds. If anybody uh, wants to jump in there, if you haven't voted, you want to um, either unmute yourself or post in the chat box. Okay, I think we're okay to proceed. 
Uh, the report of the inspector shows that a majority of the voting members present in person or by proxy have voted for the election as directors of the following persons. For three-year terms, Robert Harrington, American Mathematical Society, Sarah Gerard, American Institute of Physics Publishing, Anne Gabriel, Elsevier, Vincent Lizzy, Taylor and Francis, Alex Vance, Geoscience World, Dean Sanderson, Springer Nature, Will Schweitzer, Silver Chair. They are hereby declared elected to serve as directors of CHORUS. Congratulations, everyone. We will now turn to Howard Ratner, Executive Director of CHORUS, to provide an update on CHORUS activities. Over to you, Howard. Well, thank you, Scott, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so I'll just get started. Um, as you know, CHORUS is a not-for-profit community effort of publishers, funders, and institutions trying to reduce the burden of complying with open and public access mandates. We are comprised of an ever-growing number of learned societies, society publishers, as well as commercial publishers, making up more than 75% of the world's published uh, output from funded research. Um, the good news is that we've just signed on NOAA this past summer, who have joined as a participating agency. We've also expanded outside of the United States, as Scott was mentioning before, with growing deals in Japan, with invaluable support really from the Japan Science and Technology Agency. Uh, here is the current chorus board, of course, which has just changed based on what you all just elected. The board must always be comprised of a majority of not-for-profits. It's built into our bylaws. And I look forward to, of course, welcoming both Dean Sanderson of Springer Nature and Will Schweitzer of Silverchair to the 2020 board. Chorus could not be where it is today without many of our working groups and committees, which are all volunteer. And the academic advisory group um, is our newest one. It was created in late 2019 and it advises the board regarding potential Chorus services and directions for institutions. Uh, Judy Russell from the University of Florida and Rick Anderson from the University of Utah both lead this group. So thanks to both of those. The Chorus Technical Working Group is led by Mark Doyle and Evan Owens, and they advise new members on the Chorus implementation and, and also guide staff on new technologies. The past year, we welcomed new members from NIST and USDA, as well as Springer Nature, who got much more involved in the Technical Working Group. The Communications Working Group helps our marketing efforts and outreach to our stakeholders. Sarah Gerard from AIPP leads this group and many thanks to them for the work on Twitter, email marketing, surveys, our website, and of course the upcoming annual report which we'll all have soon. The Governance and Nominations Committee helps put together the slate for the election and advises on potential governance changes, especially our bylaws. This has been an active group in the past year under the extremely capable leadership of D David Karate. Here's a look at the CORA staff, and you can see that it's rather small, um, and the contractors that we do business with. Many thanks go to Tara Packer and Mark Robertson for doing the heavy lifting that makes CORA work. And development services are supplied by ACE Labs and legal by Ewenstein and Roth, and AIP Finance continues to do excellent work on our back office finances. So these were the high level goals for 2019. They're set out, as we have had before, into four quadrants. They are increased funder participation, increased member participation, increased institution participation, and expanding our metadata database. And of course, meeting or exceeding our financial projections. So looking at each one of these quadrants individually, you can see here for the funder goals, we had excellent relationships with all of our agency participants, NSF, DOE, DOD, USDA, Smithsonian, IARPA, NIST, USAID, and JST. And as mentioned before, NOAA signed on with us last summer, and I'm still ho hopeful that NASA is still possible in 2020, as we're still in active discussions with them. Unfortunately, as of the end of 2019, we've had no new international partnerships yet to, re to report. Regarding membership, as Scott was indicating before, we ended 2019 with 42 members, which is not quite the 44 publishers we were seeking. We, we ended the year with six affiliates, which is well shy of the 11 affiliates goal. 83%, not quite 85% of our publishers were fully implemented as of the latest publisher implementation analysis from December, 2019, which I will show you now um, in, in, in more detail. 
And we also explored adding new member types in 2019. However, the board felt that now wasn't quite the right time to introduce them. So here's a look at one of the pages from our implementation report. This is, this is a summary that we use for tracking the course publisher member goals. It highlights the progress made by our publisher members from 2016 to 2019. And you can see that the only goal not met is the one regarding reuse licenses. It should have been, we were hoping for 85%, but, but we got close, but only 83%. But all of the other ones, funder, the identification of funder IDs, making things openly accessible and archiving are well above what, what we were hoping for. So that's really good news. An interesting fact that I pulled out when I was looking at some of our numbers, because um, a lot of people talk about Chorus being very much of an, um, an accepted manuscript play and only that, but actually when we look at it across our, the breadth of our database, you can see that we're actually 50-50 between accepted manuscripts and versions of record, with most of those VORs coming from um, gold open access. Regarding um, institutions and those goals, it was a tough year in 2019. Uh, like I said, we have three out of the th three out of the ten in the U U.S. institutions. Plus, we we still have five U.S. trials going. We have five. We got f uh, five out of the go uh, out of ten for Japan institutions. Plus, we still do have a great number of uh, Japan trials going. And I can tell you already that some of that has borne fruit because two Japanese institutions have signed up for 2020, which is good news. Uh, we explored and began work on some um, additional services in this area for institutions, such as the automated deposit into institutional repositories and a brand new research office report. But there's a lot more work to do with those and we'll be reporting more back to you more about them as the work progresses. Considerable work was done in 2019 to expand our metadata database. We expanded coverage to include all publishers worldwide and also expanded some funders, especially in Japan. This first phase was completed in June, 2019. Then in September 2019, we expanded coverage of data set metadata linking to the articles that we monitor. And we can now issue reports on demand that, uh, that we have a lot more detail about those linked data sets, like the names of the repositories, types of data, data set creator, et cetera. Explorations were done regarding automating accepted manuscript deposits. This led to a board discussion which steered the conversation sort of away from the automated de deposits of AMs, but actually towards the automated deposit of gold VORs to help enable transformative agreements. And this is being worked on in 2020. Identifying preprints was also something that we did in 2019. So here we were reporting on agency funded research in those preprint servers. Um, that, but that was explored and then parked. Honestly, it was parked because there was no funding for it. There was no funding coming from any potential stakeholders. So this is still out there, something that we could do if we were to find the right funding partner for it, but it, it is something that we did not choose to progress. And then finally, we did improve the speed of our existing search service to make it much more usable. And there's more work to be done regarding our search. As Scott has already reported in the Treasury report, we exceeded the 2019 budget revenue target for the first time ever. And we were below the 2019 budget expense target, which is great. Um, so that's all good news. Regarding 2020 goals, so we did create goals and they were approved by the board back in 2019. However, with the current world crisis going on, the board feels it's prudent to soon revisit these goals from the economic landscape becomes a bit more clear. However, we're already moving ahead with a few of these projects. So if we're further expanding the coverage of our data set metadata, we are improving affiliation information such as ROR, et cetera. We're exploring gold VOR deposits and exploring the monitoring of data availability policies along with doing some work with STM. In 2020, we will be actively reaching out to our community much more than ever before. We've done a number of surveys uh, helping to ensure CORA stays engaged and focused on serving and supporting our community in the best possible way. And it's important that we provide direct personal support for our community. Hosting and participating in reports uh, like the JST Chorus Tokyo workshop is something brand new that we did. Uh, much thanks to Mark Robertson for making that happen. Uh, participating in the, the most recent STM US conference. And of course, you all know about the postponed Chorus Forum on op Open Access Policies and compliance, which we actually do hope to revisit soon. We've been posting a lot of success stories, um, highlighting the members and partners and, and how they're using the Chorus tools and dashboards to monitor open access, improve reporting, and advance their OA missions. 
We also actively help onboard new publishers, funding agencies, and institutions. So a couple of new things that I wanted to highlight. So just this week, we launched the Chorus Publisher Data Availability Policies Index on our site. And Chorus has created this free uh, centralized index of member publishers' data availability policies with links to the policies on the publisher sites. So because over the last few years, publishers have been making these policies um, known, um, but we don't think that they've been particularly transparent. So these policies are either at the publisher level or at the journal level. And these policies range in their, in their mandate, but most require authors to make all data necessary to replicate the study's findings publicly available without restriction at the time of publication. And so again, we felt that making these policies much more transparent will help everyone raise their game in open science. This chart is available now on our website and will be updated at least annually by Cora staff. And we've already been receiving some feedback from some of the publishers about some new links and, and there are some things that are still TBD. The other thing that I want to uh, pre-announce is the phase two of our metadata database expansion coming very, very soon, possibly as early as next week. You will see a significant jump, and this is what this is indicating here, um, in content identified as reporting on funded research. So what is this about? Well, we'll be adding all records from Crossref that include a funder ID. So that means including all funders worldwide. Uh, we're confident that you can enjoy this en enhancement and it will help you make more informed decisions about your open access plans. Um, I wanna thank you very much. And honestly, I couldn't have done it without, without all of you. So thank you. Any questions? There are no questions in the chat. Scott, um, back to you. We'll give it uh, just another minute for anyone to unmute themselves if they have any questions they want to ask verbally. Okay. Well, thank you, Howard. Um, that, that was a great report. Um, and, and I want to commend you and, and Mark and Tara um, really for, for the work you've done uh, over the past year. I mean, it's really, it's clear that, uh, that you're all dedicated to the organization and, and uh, you know, under trying circumstances over the past year, um, you, you've done a great job. Um, I want to just turn now as we're coming to the close of the official uh, board uh, member meeting uh, to see if anyone on the call, any of the members uh, have questions, general questions about uh, the organization, about board activities, um, comments that you'd like to make. Uh, obviously, if we were in person, um, as we have been over the past years, um, we would have the opportunity to be a bit more interactive and a bit more informal. Um, but I do want to give a moment for anyone to come forward and ask questions uh, really under any, any topic at all relating to Chorus. Scott? Yeah. Um, not hearing anything. I just personally want to give a, th a big thank you to Thane for the service that he's given to the chorus board since 2013. I know Thane is stepping off the board um, as, as of today um, and Will will make a, an excellent replacement, but he's certainly no Thane because Thane was definitely one of the drivers along with Susan King and others to make chorus happen. So Thane, thank you very much. Seconded. Thank you, Thane. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, in his absence, I would, I would do the same, obviously for Michael Forrester, uh, who was our, our, our previous chair uh, for the work that he did uh, over, over the past few years, um, recent years on the board and, and, and of course chairing. Um, and as I think everyone knows, he's left IEEE uh, and, um, and so uh, stepped down, well, it's been about maybe a month ago, um, three or four weeks ago. Uh, but I want to thank him for his service. And, uh, and of course, it's uh, Dawn who has uh, stepped onto the board from IEEE. I believe Dawn is on the call. Uh, so here. thank her for, for doing that. Um, any other business at all before we close the, the annual meeting? Okay. Uh, there appearing to be no uh, further uh, or new business to come before this meeting, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that the meeting be adjourned. Thank you, Susan. 
the chair hearing no objections and a second. Uh, the 2020 annual meeting of members of CHORUS is hereby adjourned. And thank you very much. <laughs>